welcome everybody. I'm Melly James, co-founder of Mana Up, and we're excited to be kicking off uh, our panel today around innovation. Everyone says innovation is the key to Hawaii 2.0, but what does it mean in practice? Why a UH leader and a Honolulu CEO believe it's really possible and why. We are thrilled to have our two panelists here joining us today and all the questions that I'm sure you guys will be having after their talks. Uh, we'd like to get started here first with Pat Sullivan, who is the chairman, CEO, and founder of Oceanet Laboratories. Uh, Pat, I'll let you take it from here. So there's a lot of talk about going back to normal. And this is what normal looked like. So it wasn't necessarily good for everybody. And I just wanted to put it out there. This slide on the left shows you how things have changed. And I know that's hard for people to get their heads around because you like to think it's fixed in stone, but it's not. Things change, the world changes, technology changes, so we must change. Um, I put this slide up because there's been a lot of talk over many, many years that we should try to be like Silicon Valley. And I put this up because most of the capital lives in Silicon Valley, but you can see a lot of those little dots are universities and colleges around the United States. And there's really virtually no capital in Hawaii. You could argue there's some, but most of it is in just a few places around the country. So we have to think of things that don't require that. And you gotta remember venture capital was an innovation. We have to innovate finance, business processes, as well as technology. So I thought I'd review what we've learned over several decades uh, at Oceanet. We're a mind to market company. So we think of things and drive it to market. And we're in these buckets of energy, aerospace, engineering, life sciences, and they've got different modalities to go to market. There's a few hundred people, about 100 PhD level scientists and engineers, and we're mostly in Hawaii, but we work all over. And I put this slide up because the word innovation is used a lot. What I'm really gonna focus on is this one in the lower left corner, disruptive innovation, because that begins this change that sweeps through society and sweeps through the planet. And what we've discovered is that's kind of our sweet spot here at Oceanet. So I break up the world into interesting, challenging, and disruptive. So interesting is things anybody can do. We do some of that. Challenging are things anybody can do, but they're hard to execute. And disruption is kind of the thing that pushes the edge of science, possibilities, and change. And we look at disruption when we think about it as things with high pain and low certainty. So the left side, the blue zone, deals with curiosity and discovery. So the people we have work almost like a little mini university group. The green side is human-centered product delivery. Those two cultures are connected in the middle through what we call the rock and roll zone. And that's because what you think you're gonna do is never quite what you're going to do until you actually meet the market. The market speaks, and when it really comes down to it, I would say, there's three flavors of risk when you're doing this. Technology risk, execution risk, and market risk. Market risk is roughly half of it. And so the market is huge. So we've, over the last decade, have been building this piece on the green side, the human-centered side. So you've got technology, viability, and desirability. And at that intersection, maybe there's something. And that's kind of how we parse it out. Now, this is an important almost simplistic way to look at things, but left axis is risk, the right axis is benefit. In the middle, we've got ideas, programs, projects, and products. So we always start out with ideas, things that we think are interesting, and then we drive the risk down as we increase the, the potential of benefit. But we start with things where we think they're interesting and important. Uh, we have Vasilis Sirmos here, who is the Vice President of Research and Innovation for uh, the University of Hawaii, and uh, we're thrilled to have you here today. Thanks, Vasilis. Thanks, Mally. I'll, uh, I will not use any slide deck, but I'll take it a little bit different than Pat. I'm going to try to give a little bit of a history on the innovation in the state of Hawaii and how I saw it uh, growing and not growing, going, not going. Over the last 30 years I have been here and uh, how every time uh, uh, the, when the economy goes into a downturn, then always the two things that they come up uh, is diversify the economy and innovation. 
I'll try to give you some examples from when I came in 91, 92, the first Gulf War, then all of a sudden diversifying the economy and innovation came up in 92, 93. Again, in 97, 98, with the burst of the Japanese bubble in real estate, the economy went down, turned, diversified the economy, came back up, and innovation. Then again, after 9-11, then again in 2008, and now again in 2020. So it's not something that we haven't seen in the last 30 years. We saw it again and again and again. I think this time it probably is going to be a little bit different because truly diversification has to happen with a lot of thought. It has to happen with reality, pragmatism, and also it has to be bold. Uh, the economy is going to continue to struggle for years to come for several reasons. And therefore, this time, I think it, uh, it should be prudent to take the diversification of the economy uh, seriously. Tourism will come back, but it will come back a little bit differently, and everybody hopes that it comes back a little bit different. So trying to innovate and diversify will be something that all of us uh, can contribute. I think there are mentors here in the state that people can look up to, uh, and you see all this wonderful ecosystem going uh, around, right? So if we are careful and we do not squash it and on the contrary actually we encourage it and we feed that ecosystem is going to flourish and uh, they're going to be 10 paths uh, 10 20 years from now and then you know can you imagine first of all how many young people we employ high paying jobs all the good stuff that we want to do um, and I, I think you are right you know as the world is shifting you know, we're looking at these industries that has been part of our main industries, tourism, military, et cetera, and having to turn it a little bit on its head and to think about what, what types of industries can be much more regenerative for our state and our economy. Um, so kind of with that in mind and everything shifting with COVID, are you, how is the university shifting with, with your departments? Are you putting more emphasis or funding or efforts towards particular tr departments that have been more unique differentiators for the university or, or how, how are things shifting now? It's a broad question. I, I will ask uh, or I, I will try to answer the question from the research uh, piece. Uh, our research uh, actually is not doing just well. It's for some uh, reason it's thriving uh, beyond belief uh, last year and this year. So for us, uh, there are a couple of things that uh, are becoming a little bit difficult. Is how we're going to execute all that work because a lot of that work is lab related, is person to person related, is clinical work, uh, and that we see a slowdown in expenditures. We don't see a slowdown in our wars. Our wars are gangbusters right now. Uh, we also see a change a little bit in the funding. We see an uptick on the funding on health uh, sciences, on healthcare, and that has to do with uh, COVID-19. We've seen some COVID-19 funding, uh, funding coming into the university both for the healthcare, but also for workforce development and retraining of, uh, of empl employees and people in the state of Hawaii. Uh, our strong areas are still the strong ones. Uh, and, uh, and that's where we are. I, I, what I worry about is I worry about people and how people react to this pandemic and how uh, how capable will be to execute all the great things they do. So I guess to, to jump into to Pat here, um, you said earlier that I guess on the, the long turn of it is, you know, that the, towards the third tier is more like commercial driven innovation. Are you seeing that major shift around what is driving a lot of the innovation and IP that, that Ocean is developing? And kind of with that in mind, with the with the 
uh, newest thing that you're going to be sharing with us was where did that start from? Um, was that a commercial driven need that was requested or how did, how did that whole thing get started? I'll let you share. I mean, we're trying to get certain programs to produce more people, uh, more PhDs in physics, uh, math, uh, computer science, uh, chemistry. There's a whole bunch of areas. And we've been recruiting a lot, I know, from the physics program, but a lot of these guys are kind of multidisciplinary. But so what we do in the fourth quarter of the year is we, we kind of take that time and ask a broad question, which kind of goes like this, you know, what should we do with our time on the planet? It's kind of an open-ended question, but, but this is, it's a discipline. And we kind of say, okay, so what should we do? Because we can do a lot of things. And so then comes the question, all right, so what do we do? What's the next thing? And, and we decided to look at blowing up the idea. And the, the thing we kind of leaned in on was uh, anthropomimetic human style AI. And the theory was that uh, humans are innately intelligent because they can speak with a language. And language becomes the key to understanding this human style intelligence. And human intelligence deals with edge cases, ambiguity, all kinds of stuff all the time. Whereas machine learning is very brittle. And you may see there's this huge competition going on in nation states now on, on deploying machine learning, for example, in um, defense systems, in managing uh, crowds and societies. So China's, you know, as a communist country, they can enjoy being a police state and just use it on everything. In the US, we're not so keen about it, but of course, you know, Google and and Facebook deploy all that kind of stuff on their own. But we just thought, okay, what if we blow that whole thing up and start from scratch? So that's what we started. And where are those opportunities for us to be creating jobs, God forbid, interesting jobs, um, high paying jobs and opportunity here in the islands? You know, I think when I look at both you and Bacillus representing kind of corporate and, and education, you know, how, how can we be creating, connecting those dots where we've got intellectual property being born at the university, where is that commercial need or, or um, how are we now training the students for things that are actually needed and useful right now in corporate? A lot of the talent. So there's this idea that I see in the press that there's no good talent in a way that's just totally wrong. So the story of this AI piece um, is interesting because uh, we've got some of the key people, they literally grew up here. You know, when they get a PhD, a lot of them might go to two or three schools, which they did, and they may end up in the best schools in the world, which they were, but this is their home. And so they may, you know, they may go to UH as an undergrad and then go to MIT for a PhD and then maybe go to Princeton for a postdoc. And so a couple of the key folks that are, you know, one was an, a Punahou grad, one is a Hawaii grad. It's kind of crazy because, you know, we're pulling these kids, young people, out of, uh, you know, I mean, literally in this case, Princeton and MIT and Harvard. And, and the team, by the way, a lot of guys we pulled out of physics because we just needed more kind of what I call utility players. Uh, as they're finishing their PhDs, we're kind of dialing them in. Uh, computer science guys. I mean, it's 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 really broad because we have pathology, um, PhD from the medical school, virology, which I think is a local guy, but his PhD was from another school in the mainland. He was a virologist at NIH for years in CDC. But the talent and the connection here is is all Hawaiian. One thing that people have to understand is that there is a very high quality of students that we graduate, especially in a lot of the technical fields. But once a kid graduates highly motivated, highly ambitious, wants to enter into a job that it is equally satisfying, equally challenging to the uh, ambitions that that young individual has. And there aren't a lot of those here. 
uh, let's be blunt, uh, there aren't a lot of these companies that will offer those type of jobs for our graduates. And you see an exodus of uh, these graduates and uh, then you hope that you can get them back, but it is very difficult because even when you hear, oh, there are jobs in computer science or in IT or cyber, you know, there are jobs, but then job A and job B can be very different in how satisfying they are for the brightest and the smartest kids uh, we have. So I'll put that out there because actually building an innovation ecosystem is beyond the economy. It is also how you can attract these very young individuals to come back to the state that they want to live. And there are a lot of kids that they're sitting in the mainland and they cannot come back because of their professional ambitions and their professional aspirations. And it is us as a state that we need to turn that around. So that's one. And in order to turn that around, it's not only the innovation ecosystem, there are policies, housing, educational uh, systems. So it's a much bigger problem of how we're not driving our youngest, smartest, brightest away from here. So, and you know, a lot of kids go out, they do great, and then some come, but most of them don't. So that's one. Then the second one about how you connect now all the dots, I do believe that it is time that both uh, the state, the university, and the business community take the innovation in a serious manner, right? In order to make successes out of all these accelerators, incubators, we need to start building serious companies that they do stay, that they do actually generate revenue and they contribute in a meaningful manner, right? So how do we go from an early stage to a little bit more meaningful is very important. And, and don't, you know, don't look at Pat. Pat is beyond that. Pat is actually for the state of Hawaii, it's, it's probably considered a large, very mature company. So the question is, how can you take all that and start moving it upward. And again, I'm going to say it, make more paths, make more awesomeness. And not doesn't have to be in just in very uh, high tech, but it got to be a whole spectrum of things. It can be in healthcare, it can be in health service, it can be in tourism. And another thing I'm going to stress again and again and again, innovation is not something that sits outside the main economy of the state of Hawaii. Because if we think that that's what it is, then we have failed from the get-go. Innovation is something that it is well embedded with the main economy in the state of Hawaii. The state does nothing to keep companies here. They seem to not care much. Starting up is where the attention is, but we're not focusing on the infrastructure to support them. And attraction, in my opinion, is all about the university producing high quality students in areas that are highly desirable. We've got a few minutes left and I wanna be able to have our panelists give some last thoughts or they can uh, share their most shocking thought of what Hawaii 2.0 could look like. Most shocking or provocative. We are in a unique state. We have a great university that actually by solving local problems uh, solves global problems as well. Thanks, Ms. Owens. Pat, any last thoughts? So I would just say the hardest thing the community needs to get used to, I think, is getting comfortable in its own skin. And by that, I mean, we don't want to become Silicon Valley. We don't want to become Singapore. We want to be Hawaiian. And I think you see on this kind of a call, and don't, you don't have to look very far, Hawaii is made up of all kinds of people. It's a culture. It's a way of thinking and caring for each other. And that is our strength, strongest asset. And the more we're comfortable with that, the better off we're all going to be. It doesn't mean we don't innovate. It doesn't mean we don't have impact. It doesn't mean any of those things. 
It means we have to be comfortable with who we are. And what that means for the future is if we get more people like that, they're not going to feel, you know, for example, families tell their kids, if you're smart, you got to leave, right? If you stay, you must be a loser. We, we, we work with all the schools. That comes from us grownups, maybe not from us on this call, but we've got to get over that and say, if you stay, that's awesome. And that's the mindset. It's not a limit of ambition. It's a limit of imagination. But all the pieces are here, and all we need to do is work with them. Thank you both uh, for your time this afternoon, and have a wonderful weekend. And to all of you guys out there watching, um, enjoy the remainder of the conference today. So thank you. Mm -hmm.